Okay, I want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. This week we are going to look at Revelation chapter 16 verses 10 through 21. This is the final judgments. We talked about that last week that we were starting the last of the bowl judgments, which are you have the seals and the trumpets, then the bowl judgments. And we went through the first four bowl judgments last week in Revelation 16, 1 through 9. Tonight we're going to finish up Revelation 16 verses 10 through 21 and look at the final destruction of earth that God unleashes his judgments on. This is it. And after this, he comes back at the second coming that we call um, his return. Prior to that, he will rapture the church out before the tribulation period starts, the seven year period starts, and we'll talk more about that. But let's just open in a word of prayer and we'll get going tonight. Father God, we are grateful as we look at these words and, and see the actions that are going to take place on earth for, because of those that have rejected you, I'm thankful that I have a personal relationship with you. And I pray for anybody listening to this that they do also, that they understand that judgment is coming, that our world is getting more evil by the day, and that one of these days you're going to come back and rapture your church out, and then you're going to start this tribulation period. So if there's anyone that is catching this message maybe for the first time and they don't know if they're saved or not they they think they are but they don't know for sure would you just convict them and guide them and direct them bless the reading of your word tonight it's in your name i pray jesus amen so tonight as i said we're going to look at verses 10 through 21 of chapter 16 and we'll kind of read these as we go down but back in revelation chapter 5 what we saw is god hand the lamb of god uh, which is Jesus Christ, he handed him a seven-sealed book, and that seven-sealed book represented the title deed, just like you have a title deed for your car or your home once it's paid off. Well, the earth has been paid off by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and because he's the creator of earth, and God gave him back in chapter 5 the title deed to earth, so he is coming back to claim his land, coming back to claim his people. Remember, there's people saved during this tribulation period, that are martyred, that are up in heaven, there's still a remnant alive of Christians at this time that have gone through all these judgments of God, been protected during this time, but still had a lot of harsh struggles, and they are being protected, and they're going to survive this tribulation period. The rest of those that have rejected Christ, which we will see, he's given them ample opportunity. You know, again, I repeat this, there's a lot of people that say, why would God send somebody to hell? He doesn't send anybody to hell. They choose that on their own because he has shown over and over, even up to this point, people can still repent unless they've gotten the mark of the beast on their right hand or their forehead. They can still repent and get saved during this time. But you will see the actions inside of God's word of what they do. So he is Jesus is coming back. He is unleashing the fifth bowl, the sixth bowl, and the seventh bowl in our passage tonight on earth. And, and when Jesus began to unseal the book that God had given him, that's when the tribulation period started. That's when all the plagues and that's when all the judgments started hitting earth. So we understand that from our time before. But each time we look into these verses, we see that the earth and those on the earth are being decimated by God's holy wrath for the seven years that's been taking place. And judgment is concluding at this point. God is wrapping it up. He's giving them all the opportunities that they've had, and they're not getting any more. His patience has been long-suffering, and that's it. And when we read these events, these final three judgments, these, again, are the conclusion of the judgments that will end this time on earth. This earth is going to be destroyed, and it's going to be destroyed by God because of the sin and because of the sinner. Okay? So... He will take possession and he'll set up his throne. But before he does that, he's going to purge it through these judgments and he's going to give people an opportunity. But he's also giving people on earth an opportunity to see what their future is should they keep rejecting him. So when Jesus returns, he'll finally receive the glory and the honor that he deserves at the Battle of Armageddon. And we'll get more into that because that's kind of the final setup here. But at his return, we know he will receive that glory and honor that he's been wanting, that he's due, that people have not given him. Even to this day, we see more and more hostility for the name of Jesus, for who Jesus is, for Christians. I saw online this morning that there was many Christians beheaded over in Africa uh, just this past day or so, over 50 Christians. 
because of their faith. They wouldn't recant their faith. Folks, that's a real life scene of something that's going to take place during this tribulation period. So the hatred is only going to grow every day that we're alive here on this earth till he raptures us out and then it's just going to speed up into warp speed. So in these verses, the Lord begins the process of his final judgment here. So let's just read starting in verse 10 and we'll work our way down to the last verse of chapter 16 and then we'll kind of break it back down. It says, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the, the Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And then it starts talking about this battle of Armageddon where all the armies gather around Jerusalem to destroy it, and God shows up, Jesus Christ shows up, and he destroys him with just his words. So starting in verse 13, we get that battle of Armageddon that you've heard about so often throughout history. And it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which will go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, verse 15, Jesus gives a little encouragement to those that are still surviving down here during this tribulation period that are his, that are Christians, that have kept the faith during all this time. He says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together in the place in Hebrew, which is called Har Megiddo. Verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, sounds of peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as not had been seen by man on this earth before. So great an earthquake it was, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And the huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and the men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hell, because its plague was extremely severe. So in the first couple of verses here, verses 10 and 11, we see that God's fifth bowl goes directly on the throne of the beast, okay? The Antichrist, that's who that is, the throne of the beast. He, up until this point, um, he's kind of avoided a lot of the plagues, but God goes directly at him because he's responsible for what's taking place. Remember, the Antichrist has been energized by Satan, and that's the unholy trinity. You've got the Antichrist, you've got the false prophet, and they have been working together to try and deceive people into believing them and to giving them worship. And during this time, God is, is finishing up his, his wrath on them. And like I said, up until now, the beast has somewhat been sheltered from a direct attack. God goes directly at him during this fifth bowl. It's poured out directly at the very seat of his power. And just like in Pharaoh, you know, I always talk about things in the Old Testament are foreshadowing something that's going to come in the New Testament. Well, just like God poured out his plagues on Pharaoh to let his people go and to make a decision to either repent or to face the consequences, the same thing is happening to the Antichrist here in the tribulation period. He's just like Pharaoh. He's a prototype of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a prototype of the Antichrist. And he, as Pharaoh was helpless against the plagues of God that Moses was given to put on uh, Pharaoh and Egypt, so the Antichrist is going to be helpless against those plagues that God pours out on them. And this plague begins, the fifth bowl plague begins at the very throne room of the Antichrist and it spreads over his entire kingdom and then over the entire world. You know, this Antichrist is going to be very, very powerful during the tribulation period and he's going to be energized by Satan. But he's also helpless, just as Pharaoh was, uh, against God himself because God is all powerful and he's going to finally wipe away this and and so that's what we see here that it is started this this fifth bowl is started directly at the throne and what happens here is darkness takes over the whole earth okay darkness takes over the whole earth now we think of darkness we get power outages all the time 
maybe in your house and you have a little flashlight and things like that, there will be no light, period. There'll be no flashlights working. There'll be no fire. There'll be none of that stuff. It will be complete darkness where you can't even see in front of your hand in front of your face. That's the kind of darkness we're talking about that they will be suddenly put into. And you know the fear people have right now. We were in the fall season where we just had the time change and it gets dark at like five o'clock and we all look at our clocks and we go, oh my goodness, it's seven o'clock, it feels like 10 o'clock. We, we don't really like the dark, a lot of people don't. Some people do, but mainly the Bible says the people that like the dark are the evil ones. I'm not saying you're evil if you like the dark, I'm just saying that that's equated with evilness, the darkness. So God puts them in complete darkness to show them who's in control of all the universe and this darkness will be so complete, nothing can penetrate it, okay? Obviously, something has changed in the atmosphere. Something has changed in the solar system where the sun is no longer uh, a factor on Earth. It is completely blacked out. Also, it suggests that something has happened to the power grid. We hear a lot of talk these days about attacks on the power grid and how, you know, it would take three to four years to get them all back up and going and it'd be a mess and it'd just push us back to the dark ages. Well, they will be pushed back to the dark ages, but not for long because their end is coming very quickly. So something happens that they experience a kind of darkness like never before. And whatever causes this darkness will be very severe and it will be very complete. There will not be one light on anywhere on the planet except Jesus Christ himself, but he will be up in heaven unleashing these bold judgments down. This is this darkness is supernaturally imposed in this fifth bowl, um, and it's a it's a foreshadow. It's it's a taste for them to understand what they're about to endure for eternity. Okay, the darkness already has engulfed the war the world in people, and now it's going to engulf the world in itself. Okay, the world has already rejected the light of the world. That's what John three nineteen says. When Jesus came, he was the light of the world, the Bible says. And the world rejected him because they loved darkness, is what John 3.19 says. The world as we see today, even right in front of us, we see that they choose to be dark morally, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally. They love darkness over light. And the only available light is Jesus Christ and the Word of God. If you will go to those things, he will open your eyes and you'll be able to see the light that he gives you, that he gives you to be able to see. There's a lot of people blinded right now and deceived into thinking that this is, this is good and this is right and this is evil, but they're deceived right now. And it's because they've been darkened. That's part of the judgment that God gives them, that he's going to give them a spirit of, of delusion as they go into these periods. And that the more they push away from God, the more they're going to be in complete chaos as to what truth is. They, there be no truth to them. So since they favor darkness, God says, and this is Romans 1 judgment, God says, if you like this sin, I'm going to turn it over to you. But So since they love darkness, he says, you're going to get more of it than you wish for. You know, And we are also told that um, when this darkness descends on men in this passage here, that they literally start gnawing their teeth. Now I want you to remember we're on the fifth bowl judgment at the end of the set of the other three. And so previously in the first four bowl judgments, they had experienced other plagues that were causing misery. Um, but now they're chewing on their tongues and, and gnawing them because they are in such pain and they're in such frustration. But they also had sores on their body that he put from the previous plagues. They were starving to death because he had polluted the ocean, the food sources, they were also in dehydration because he had polluted all the fresh water sources, whether you have a water bottle in your refrigerator or whatever. There will be no clean water at that time. He's going to completely turn it into blood, the oceans, and the fresh drinking water. Plus, he turned up the heat of the sun so people are in complete pain from the burning. And I'm not just talking about sunburn. I'm talking about if you were to take a welding torch and run it across your arm for an hour, that kind of burn, it's going to be very severe. And then you add the pain of this, all these things added on top of each other, that's what's going to add to the misery, the darkness, because at night, you know, it seems like whenever whatever pains you're having, they just intensify. Well, they're going to intensify during this period because God is trying to get their attention. 
and he's also judging them. So what we are seeing here is God had given them a glimpse of hell because hell is going to be a very dark place. It's going to be a place of torment. And God is letting the Antichrist and his followers get a little taste of them, of what's coming for them. He, they've had plenty of opportunities again to turn to him. And Jesus says, you're going to get a taste of hell. And Jesus has talked about inside of scripture many times what hell's going to be like. And he gives a little peek in Matthew 25, 30, talking about this. Um, on one occasion, he's talking about hell. And he says, throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we know that that's a couple of characteristics of hell. It's going to be dark. It's going to be a place of severe pain, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's going to be a place people cannot escape. There's not going to be any time out. There's not going to be any person pulled out of that. That is where they are going to spend eternity. So again, what we see here is a small glimpse of what those that reject Jesus Christ are going to face when they finally get to hell, and that time is coming very quickly, not only in our passage, but in our world. We are heading on in a fast train towards that time period when God says enough is enough. If people are not saved, if you're one of the people that's listening tonight and you are not saved, you better wake up really quick because you might not have the opportunity to make a last minute ditch of your your uh, rebellion and turn to Christ. You may never know. We never know when our time will come. But there is a real place called hell. There is real people that are in hell. And there's a real eternity. And there's a real judgment that's coming on this earth that's been taking place on this earth that God has set up since the beginning of, of time. And he does not want you to go there. That's something I keep repeating because a lot of people feel like their life is hopeless. Your life is not hopeless. Turn to Jesus Christ, and he can give you that light and that hope. So then we see in verse 11 that a lesson is declared. Because they didn't repent, this is what God says. When the plagues come, when the pains come, you would think that people would shout out in mercy and say, God, you know, I'm trusting you, not these people. They shake their fist at God, and, and they basically blaspheme him and say that you, and curse him and say, you're the reason I'm miserable. You're the reason that all these things have happened and I hate you. And they're going to continue to do that. And they're going to get even more severe during this time because of all the stuff that they've gone through. Some still hold to this view that people aren't bad. You know, I hear this from time to time when somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. I think I'll make it to heaven. There's no thinking. And the Bible also says that in Romans 3.10 that there's none good, no, not one. All of us are unrighteous. All of us deserve hell and the punishment of God's wrath. But he gives us an opportunity through the Son dying on the cross to have our sins forgiven and to have eternal life. The fact that we see all this stuff where man continues to shake his fist at God during all these plagues, we see that man is totally depraved. It doesn't mean that there isn't any spiritual good inside of each person. There, there, God says that he, there's a piece of him that we are made in his image, but we've got to open that image up. We've got to receive his message that he's calling to us when he taps us on our hearts and our shoulders to come to him. We've got to, we've got to awaken to that, and we've got to go towards that. And he gives everybody an opportunity. You know, it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Everybody has an opportunity, but it's up for them to see and seek the Lord on their own. It's an individual game here, folks. It's not anything your parents can do, your friends can do. You have to do this on your own. And what we see in this passage here is that mankind left to themselves will only grow more evil, okay? Uh, people left to themselves, look at our world today, people left to themselves and, and away from God will only get more evil and more wicked. This judgment, if it proves anything, it proves that man is absolutely sinful and that we have a corrupt core inside of us that needs to be redeemed and changed and trans transferred over to the righteousness that Christ has. We need to have our sins forgiven. And this also proves because salvation, it also proves that salvation is totally of God. Had God not called you and me, if you're saved, we would be in this mess that's taking place. We would be in hell. It proves that man, when he's confronted with the power and judgment of God, still has an option to turn away from him, and people still do. 
Jonah said in, in the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9, he says, Salvation is of the Lord. He knew it when he saw the city of Nineveh repent. He knew that it was a God thing. It wasn't anything that he did. It wasn't his great sermon because he probably didn't have his heart in that sermon when he preached it because he really wasn't interested in the city of Nineveh getting right, but they all did. It proves that salvation requires direct divine intervention. And what I mean by that, if, if you are not saved or, and when you were saved, you remember that moment that God came down to you and he started speaking to you and he said, it's time for you to get right on. I'm tired of the way you're living. You, you need to come to me. Or maybe you got saved as a young child and that's awesome that he called you early where you didn't have to go through all the messes of life and learn the hard way. He just slowly took you like a little lamb into his arms and he guided you from that day forward. You know, if God did not come personally to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ, in the man of Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man to convict us and save us by his grace, we would all be in hell at this time. We would all have that same rebellious heart that these folks that we're seeing in Revelation 16 have. And if it not be for the grace of God, we would all be at this moment heading towards hell, if not already there. You know, when people go to hell, some, some people will write books or some will say that as they're going down, they're crying out to God, God, forgive me, save me and all this. I don't believe that's the case. Looking at the scripture and looking at what people do, I believe as they fall into hell and as they go to hell, they're screaming out, cursing God for being placed there in that time. We have the example of the rich young man in Luke 16, verses 19 through 21. There was no hint of remorse when Jesus confronted him and convicted him. Of over the life that he lived, there was only sorrow for the sentence that he received, that he couldn't receive heaven till he sold his goods, his idol. He had to get rid of his idol. He could either worship his things or he could worship God, and he chose his things over that. When people go to hell, they will blaspheme God. They will curse God. They won't be crying out for a second chance. They will curse him and his judgment. So let's look at the second point here, and we see that this in the sixth bowl here, in verses 12 through 16, we see that there's a battle that's being planned inside of Scripture here. And it says this, And they gathered them together to the place in which the Hebrew is called Har Megiddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl on the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there was flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunders and a great earthquake such that it has not been seen by man since it came upon the earth. So great an earthquake it was and so mighty. So here's what we see that takes place here in this passage. The sixth bowl is poured out and it sets the stage for Armageddon. What God does by pouring out this bowl, we're told that the Euphrates River is dried up. And the Euphrates River begins in Turkey and flows down south through Iraq into the Persian Gulf. And of course with modern armies and as they get more advanced each day, um, rivers really aren't a factor when people are going to war. This river is around 1,700 miles long and it's 3,600 feet wide at some places. And it's been a dividing line for many centuries between the east and the west, but God removes all obstacles. He, he is setting the bait for all those that have rejected him to go right into the place where he's gonna annihilate them. You know, many hunters, they, they have a place that they set up, they'll put food plots, they'll put different things out there and they're expecting the animals to come there. They'll have their game trails, and they'll see the track where they're going. Well, that's what God is doing here. He's setting the bait for all the armies of the world to come, and their whole purpose is to annihilate Israel at this time. But when they get there, Big Brother's going to show up. Big Daddy's going to show up, which is Jesus Christ himself, and he's going to wipe them away. God, again, will remove every obstacle that's in the Middle East so that they can come. And from how will this river dry up? Well, we know from the previous plagues that we had, the sun got hot, the rainfall was cut down, there wasn't any evaporation because the oceans were poisoned with blood, the fresh water sources. So they are in a drought with the heat of the sun and the lack of rain. So this, this river is going to dry out. Also, we know um, from history and we know from science that many dams have been built built along the Euphrates River. So some engineer could just simply cut off the water and allow easy access for the armies to come. However, the fourth bowl, as we know, intensifies the sun, and that's what I really believe, that it's just gonna dry up and it's gonna be hard. 
Either way, it's going to be the result of divine intervention. It's not by chance that this takes place. In verse 12, we see an army. And what is this army's intention? The army's intention is total destruction of Israel. We're told that a vast army from the east will come towards Israel and they'll use the highway that was created by the drying up the, of the Euphrates River and they will move towards Israel. And it's called, it says that the kings of the east, that Satan gets all these kings so stirred up that, and influences them to go after Israel, they all unite and they start heading that way. And when it talks about um, the phrase, the king of the east, which literally means the kings of the rising sun, many have always gone to the default of that's China because in an earlier passage in Revelation 9, 16, it talks about a 200 million man army. And we know that China has that army and, and that the Bible talks about. It could be China, it could be not. Here's what I see today in present day, and I could be totally wrong. This is Jimmy's opinion. But what I see is there's a clash that's been growing and growing between those that are um, in Islam, of the Muslim faith, and those that are Christians. And I believe that's what's going to head, go head to head in this battle. I believe the Muslim nations are going to head towards that way and there's going to be a showdown basically between Islam and the Jews because the Jews have always hated, or the Muslims have always hated the Jews, and that's where I believe all the coalition of the Muslim countries are going to come forward during that time. Remember, there's going to be a false religion that's going to be promoted during this time, and it could very well be partly Islam and partly the Antichrist's false religion that they build on. And the Arab nations have surrounded Israel for many centuries, and they have always tried to oust the Jews, but they failed at every attempt. And this has created a great hostility and hatred for the Jews. And the Arabs hate the Jews, and they long for total destruction of them. That's in their teachings. That's in their, their beliefs that until the Jews are destroyed, they can't have the caliphate that they're looking for. And anybody that is not a Muslim is considered an infidel in the Islam culture, in the Muslim culture. So if you are not a Muslim, you either need to repent or you need to die is the way you get converted, okay? And there's all kinds of references in the Quran, which is the um, Islam Bible, if you will. That's a horrible term for it. But it all talks about the Jews are, are going to hell and that anybody that's an infidel must be killed. And we call that radical Islam today. And it's going to be even more radical at this time. It would be radical Islam that I believe would fill this huge army, this 200 million uh, man army, to go after the Jews because, as I said, right now we see the anti-Semitism going on. It's getting stronger, and the Arabs absolutely despise the Jews. These peace treaties that our government has made with the Arabs, you know, have made other Arabs upset, and they're very upset. And it says in verses 13 and 14 that when this judgment is poured out, that it's as if three frogs are seen coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we know frogs are unclean animals, but the frogs represent unclean spirits or demons. And we know that the mouth is a source of influence. So it seems that Satan will inspire these world leaders. That's with the frogs coming out. It's coming, they're coming to, it's a, a imagery that John is giving that the Satan will inspire these Arab or whatever it is leaders to go after and assault Israel that there'll be a heavy coalition formed between these world armies that will march toward Jerusalem that will march towards Israel in the final war and remember that final war is satanically inspired and energized and in verse 15 here in chapter 16 Jesus kind of takes a pause to those earth dwellers that are his, those Christians down here, and he, he sends this message on to the world, and he says this. He says, look, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who is alert and remains closed so that he may not go naked and see his shame. So on the heels of judgment, a very heavy announcement is made here. Ever since Jesus ascended back to heaven, it's been known that he, it's been prophesied also that he would return. Now, the rapture is not his second return. We meet Jesus up in the clouds, if that's our generation. Whoever the generation is that gets raptured, they meet Jesus up in the clouds with those that have died previously that are Christians. The second coming is when he comes at the end of the tribulation period 
and he fights his great battle at the Battle of Armageddon. You know, seven years prior to this event that we're talking about here, this final war, that's when the tribulation started and that's when the church was raptured out of here. And Jesus is telling his precious people on earth just to hang on. And that's what he's telling you today. If, if you're frustrated and we've been bombarded with all kinds of news and, and many of us have been, feel like that we just are about to pop, we can't handle any more tragedies or things like that. Jesus is telling you and me today, hang on. I got this. Hang on. You know, and he's telling the saints of God, he's trying to encourage them to keep the faith that in a few more days, he will return at his second coming. He's going to come like a thief in the night. And how does a thief in the night come? comes unexpectedly, and that's the ideal here. Jesus has lets his people know that their waiting will soon be over, and he's telling us that today. He's telling us to hang on, that our waiting will soon be over. So let's talk about this battle of Armageddon. The army's been assembled by Satan to destroy the people of God. The devil still thinks he's in control up to this point. He's marching this army, but verse 14 tells us that this army is being gathered to the battle of the great day of the God Almighty, okay? And then verse 16 says he gathered them together, talking about God. So even though Satan thinks he's in control, God is still the ringmaster setting this match up for the final end. God gathers the nations of the world into this valley of Megiddo. He's getting them all into a bowl, kind of like custard got sucked into that, that canyon there and was wiped out. The army was wiped out at that time. That's what God is doing. He's setting them up to destroy them. We've already considered the Valley of Megiddo in our previous studies. We've looked at those back um, in previous chapters in Revelation, and we know that that valley is very famous for a lot of Christian battles. Barak and, and Deborah defeated the Canaanites there in Judges chapter 5. Gideon defeated the Midianites in Judges 6. It's the same valley where Jonathan and King Saul were killed in 1 Samuel 31, and also jo Josiah, good King Josiah was killed in 2 Chronicles there. And you, if you remember, I told you that Napoleon in his diary wrote that he described this battlefield as the perfect place for battle, and he believed that the final battle would take place there. Well, he was right, and we'll get to more of that when we get into chapter 19. Let's talk about our last point here, the seventh bowl, okay, the final bowl that takes place. And this is verses 17 through 21. Let's look at these. It says, And the seventh bowl poured out on the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Remember on the cross, Jesus says, It is finished. That's going to have a key piece to this. It's, he says, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, sounds of peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as had not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. Verse 19, the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God. And remember, Babylon represents a lot of things. It re represents the, the system of the Antichrist. And, and it represents wickedness. Okay, it's not just a city. It says, Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Verse 20, and every island fled away. Are you catching what God's doing here? And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down um, on the men that blasphemed God because of the plague of hell, because the plague was extremely severe. So the seventh bowl is poured out. And what it does, God is, is unleashing this awful wrath of judgments, and it's about to come to an end. Everything's about to be wrapped up. This final judgment is on the world system, and it's all going to be destroyed. Since the dawn of time, man has been, mankind has been rebelling against God and rebelling against God, and God's timetable has been going to this point where the clock has gone off, and man has rebelled in his personal life, he's rebelled in his public life, in his political life, he's rebelled in his productive life. He hadn't fulfilled the purposes God created him to. And in these verses, we see that the entire world system, it's not just over in the Middle East this is taking place, the entire world system is going to come crashing down and be left with nothing. And let's just look at Babylon's demise. Remember, that speaks of the world system. And we see in verse 17 that a sentence is fulfilled. It says, as the bowl is poured out, a voice from the throne says, it is done. And this statement signals a couple things. It signals the fact that judgment has reached its end, that Jesus is on his way, that he is preparing to claim everything he purchased from the cross. Remember on the cross when he says, it is finished. 
he was announcing victory. Here, when he says, it is done, he's announcing the verdict. Okay, so at the cross, that was victory he was announcing. Here, when he says, it is finished, or he says, it is done, he's announcing the verdict, that all the judgment on the earth is done. Okay, he is letting us, um, he is letting us know that we have reached the end of the judgment period, that all the plagues and everything are over, and that glory is just around the corner. You know, there's a lot of you fighting through that have fought through some serious things, and it's so sweet to get on the other side of it. And that's the way it's going to be during this tribulation period. It's going to be sweet to get on the other side. And God has been judging the earth throughout this whole tribulation period, and he's saying it's over. It, it, it's about done. Wave after wave of divine wrath has been pouring down. You know, we, we get heavy rains from time to time, and it just seems like it's never going to stop. Well, wave after wave of heavy wrath has been pouring down the earth, and still they defy God. And here, in one final stroke here, God destroys the whole last power source of the Antichrist and his system. God destroys everything that man has built and glories himself in, and the world is brought to its knees at this point. Let's talk about some of the parts of this plague. It says a great earthquake in verse 16. We, we have earthquakes all the time. They've rebuilt the dam over here with all kinds of equipment to tell us that there's future earthquakes coming that could damage the dam. They've tried to build it up. Um, earthquakes happen around the world quite frequently, and a lot of them go unnoticed. You know, we don't live out on the west coast inside of that that uh, area that receives a lot of those, but we see on the news from time to time, and we've seen lately some very devastating earthquakes. Uh, many of you remember the one in 2004 where the tsunami was created by the earthquake that took out Sri Lanka. Uh, there was a huge one that took place in Alaska um, around 1970, I believe, right around there, that was so massive that it depos deposited a cargo ship on top of a mountain several thousand miles inland okay that's how massive and how strong these can be you know the this quake earthquake that is mentioned here in in this last bowl judgment is going to be so severe it's going to totally change the earth's top, um, topography it's going to change everything that takes place and it says that the great city is affected in verse 19 and that probably refers to jerusalem it says it's split into three parts at this time and I believe part of that is for the survivors to be able to get away from the judgments that are taking place and the armies that are coming and all that. But also, back here in the United States, major cities are going to be wiped out at this time. Keep that in mind. L.A., New York, you know, Tokyo, uh, Moscow, London, Paris, Rome, all these cities that are so great today and people take such pride in, they're going to be gone. They're going to be wiped out. All the centers of pleasure, of economics, and power will be taken away in the twinkling of an eye. And again, we'll look at more details of this in chapter 17 and 18. But what we need to understand is the seat of the Antichrist's power and the seat of the false prophet's power is going to be totally destroyed. The city, the system behind it, all those will suffer as well as the rest of the world. And in verse 20, it says that the islands and the mountains disappear. Many of you have been to Gatlinburg, many of you have been to the Rockies, you've, you've been to, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the other ones out there, but all the mountains are going to be gone, all the islands are going to be gone, okay, the entire geographical makeup of the earth is going to be changed in a moment because of that earthquake, that's how huge it is, okay, the world will be returned to what it was like pre-flood, when the pre-flood, there's a Pangea theory where if you look at the continent, everything broke apart and it almost looks like you could piece everything together. And that's kind of the ideal here is everything's going to be returned to what it was prior to the flood. And then in the last couple of verses, it's this giant hailstone. So anything that survived, all these plagues, the heats, the drought, all those things, any person that's survived these things, they have one last uh, trick-or-treat. Uh, present waiting for them, and that's 100 to 125 pound hail. Some of your versions say a talent, and a talent was what a grown man could lift during a day. But 100 pound balls of ice are going to come flying down, and I've been in hail storms where baseball size and everything, and everything that's left behind at this time is going to be completely devastated by the earthquake, and what's left from the earthquake is going to be smashed to pieces, including people, whatever, 
by these huge balls of ice that are raining down and the whole earth will be covered in these shards of ice. Cars, houses, everything of any value will be gone at that time. And then it says, after all these things, after everything that they've experienced in verse 21, you would think that the people would be crying out for mercy. They'd be crying out for God, but they blaspheme God. It's hard to imagine how somebody's heart could be that hard. But it just proves that the condition of us left to ourselves, spurning God, we are totally depraved and we won't repent and we won't turn to God. You know, I praise God for you and me that are saved, that we won't see this day from the earth. We will be viewing it from heaven as God is cleansing the earth and getting his glory that he deserves. I praise him for salvation, that I'm not one of the rebellious ones that is going to face hell. And I praise him for you too, that if you're saved, you're not going to face that. Remember, you don't get into heaven by dying. You get in there by having a personal relationship with Jesus. And I want to call your attention back to verse 15 here real quick. It says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is who the, the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame focus on that verse tonight. Will you be ready when he returns? We don't know. It could be the rapture. It could be him coming for us in our own death at any time. We don't know. But the key is being ready because if you're ready, you don't worry about those things. Yeah, there's things that bring anxiety to us and, and stuff from time to time, but the real beauty of it is when you know him, you know peace. To know him is to know peace. And I hope you have that. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to do that today. Repent of your sins. Call out to him today. You don't need a preacher, a priest, whatever. You just need your time with him and ask him to save you. That you've offended a holy God and that you don't want to face his wrath and his judgment. You want eternal life with him. And you, you beg on his mercy and his grace for forgiveness. I hope uh, this is woke you up if you're not woke and if you are saved uh, we celebrate our salvation god again we are grateful for what you've done in our lives and grateful for the power that you show throughout these verses that judgment is coming on this earth and the sooner we get right with you the sooner we don't have to worry about that and the beautiful thing is your word says you are coming soon so many times help us to be prepared for that moment for those that don't know you just convict their hearts and draw them to you. Our world needs you right now, Lord. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.